Jesus. It was 20 years, almost to the day, Muhammad Ali has won. that he was defeated in Zaire. Right hand landed there. One punch and another. First one was just too high. I lowered it a little bit. And two words. It happened! It happened! The idea that a 45-year-old man could knock out a 26-year-old man was outlandish. It happened. The impossible dream has happened. The idea that this long, magical journey of George's... I'm living witness that God is real. George Foreman. I was wrong. Fight service. Thank you. George Foreman, lean, lean, grilling machine. Could somehow have led back to the heavyweight championship of the world. It happened. There weren't, you know, like 12 champions. There was one guy. George Foreman. George Foreman. George Foreman. George Foreman. He was good guy, bad guy. I'm heavyweight champ of the world. All of the skeletons, the out of the closets. And a vicious left by knockout by George. Down goes Ray. All these things couldn't possibly have happened. They did. Down goes Ray. That's what made him the greatest boxer of all time. Look at my life. If you can dream anything, you can do it. This is George Foreman. Beyond the glory. Absolutely outstanding. Unbelievable. Do you have anything to say to your fans? George Foreman's stunning knockout of Michael Moore captured the imagination of the public. Doesn't no matter who you are, anything your heart desires can come to you if you just don't give up on your dreams. And the attention of Madison Avenue. I was wrong. I was wrong. Suddenly there were commercials and all these other things that were just fabulous. Right service, right price. He had found what you can only call a sales pitch. There's no way in the world that you can lay down and stop dreaming just because you had a birthday or two. The idea of, well, you're only as old as you think you are. George got his own sitcom, a gig on HBO, and a bevy of endorsements. Then came the grill. George Roman himself is here. Oh. Welcome back to QVC. Thank you so much. Thanks to George's relentless promotion, over 50 million grills have been sold. In 1999, he sold his interest in the grill for $137 million. George Foreman, the boxer, was famous. George Foreman, the salesman, is a phenomenon. He's got such enthusiasm, and he is such a great salesman, and people trust him, and people love him. The adoration is still strange for a man once reviled for his brutish behavior. I traveled around the country as heavyweight champion of the world, and people were booing me, looking at me, and I'd look back at them, they ducked their head. And now, all of a sudden, I'd get into the ring, and I heard cheers, standing ovations. George Foreman had completed a remarkable lifelong transformation. From street thug to preacher. From villain to hero. You're talking about two different people. Two people so different that I think that George almost feels as though he's totally outside of that first person and looking back at that first person as though it's somebody he knew. I can knock anybody out. Look at that punch to his body. Man, I'm tough. Look at me. Every time I'd get in the ring, I had to have this rage and this hate for this man, and I'd beat those guys just like they were a piece of a, a tree or something. You saw George just then already showing anger and waiting to get at one of his opponents. George was such a different George. From now on, I am not going to be able to blame anything that happens to me on anyone else. It was like seeing the king of the jungle suddenly become a bunny rabbit. I wish I was able to say something quickly like Joe Lewis and get my point across. I learned the poem. The poem went, serene, I fold my hands and wait, nor care for wind, nor tide, nor sea. For lo, my own shall come to me. The 
wealth that George Foreman has amassed lies in sharp contrast to his humble childhood. When you use the word poor, when you describe us, that's not the way to do it. You gotta say po. We couldn't even afford an R, an O. <laughs> we didn't have clothes. Uh, we wore hand-me-down. People give us clothes. George's mom, Nancy, struggled to feed her seven children. She sometimes bring home a, a hamburger from the restaurant. And I don't know how, but she spit and break that thing off to all of us, and we get a piece of it. And I'll never forget the taste of a hamburger in those days. George was much bigger than his brothers and sisters, and his father planted an early seed. He'd always grab me and put his hand on my head and said, the next heavyweight champion of the world. I had no idea what a heavyweight champion was or who he was in those days, but it sure didn't make me feel good. George did his fighting on the streets of Houston's Fifth Ward, known locally as the Bloody Fifth. In Lyons Avenue, it was a pretty tough street. We had one end, it was a lot of killings, and the ends that George and I hung on, it was a lot of fighting. Regular night in Fifth Ward for us was a bottle of wine, a bottle of Thunderbird, and grapefruit juice, mix it together, shake it up, and a pack of cigarettes. A friend introduced me to Muggy. He said, look, I know these guys that leave out of these places. They're always half intoxicated. All you got to do is grab them, Big George, hold them up, hold them on the ground. We'll get the wallet, and we just run. Somebody coming down there stumbling or something like that, we reach in their pocket and get a cup of dollars, and we go get another bottle of wine. That was it. George left school in ninth grade. Did we have any hopes or dreams of getting out of Fifth Ward back then? To be honest and truthfully, no. We figured that was it. That was our environment. That's who we were. This is Johnny Unitas, quarterback for the Baltimore Colts. Johnny Unitas, a great football player, did a public service. If you're 16 to 21 and feeling downhearted because you can't get a chance, sign up in the Job Corps. I said, wow, I was a high school dropout, a teenage mugger. I needed a second chance. I didn't want to steal anymore. They told me they want educators, train us for a skill, and they were going to send money home for us. I said, wow, sign us up. I guess we were scared, nervous, bewildered. But, you know, we was taking a step towards, uh, let's say, uh, new territory. I got on an airplane for the first time. People were nice to me, stewardess giving peanuts, all the way into Medford, Oregon. Then it's off to the woods, Grants Pass, Oregon. What is this, huh? Look nothing like Fifth Ward, huh? What is this? I've never seen that many trees in my whole life. There were so many different people from different kind of backgrounds, and it opened me up. But part of George's mind remained in the bloody fifth. I pick fights all the time. Kids look at me funny, and I figured I better show them that I'm the toughest kid. Territory, that's, what, that's all we knew. That's what we knew. We ain't know nothing there. We ain't no sitting down talking about nothing diplomatically, you know what I mean? Say, man, what you looking at me like this for? Pop. After six months, George was transferred to a job corps center in Northern California, where he would meet his mentor. I saw a little guy walk by, a tough, bald-headed man, and someone said, I said, who is that guy? He said, that's the boxing coach. And I ran to him. I said, hey, I want to be a boxer. And he looked me up. He said, well, you're big enough and you're ugly enough. Come on down to the gym. That was Doc Brodus. Doc Brodus was a former boxer himself, and he made George his protege. His wife thought he was crazy. My wife says, I was like you fooling with that nigga. You'll never amount to nothing. And I cried like a baby. 
And that's how bad it hurt me. And I said to myself, I said, before I'm through with him, he gonna be somebody. <laughs> Doc was right, and it wouldn't take long. But stardom shines a spotlight, and it hit George right between the eyes. He said, after the brothers did that thing, how could you wave that flag? That's when anger started to sit in with me. How could I not wave that flag? You never knew which George you were going to deal with. George was a very evil man at one time. when George Foreman first got in the ring. He was raw, but dangerous. We started training and everything, and knocking, knocking these guys out, knocking these bums out. George raced through the Golden Gloves to the Olympic trials, where his raw power obliterated his veteran opponents. Just 19, he earned a spot in the 1968 Olympics. In Mexico City, George would be branded a hero and a traitor. That place was hotter than the firecracker. Oh, it hotter than living toys. That was one of the more political Olympics um, because of the black power uh, defiance of authority. But the calls for a boycott never reached George's ears. All of the other athletes were highly uh, visible. They were exposed to these guys. <laughs> I wasn't in college. No one even came and said, George, what are you going to, you know, are you going to bark out the Olympics? They didn't even know my name. We come for one thing and one thing only, gentlemen. We come for this gold medal. I didn't have any political opinions until the day in the Olympic Village when John Carlos and Tommy Smith were expelled. The sprinters raised fists had sparked an outrage. With the boxing finals still remaining, all eyes turned to George. Everyone is asking, what am I going to do? What are you going to do? I'm thinking, I got to get in and fight that guy from Russia, you know? <laughs> this is the climactic event of the Olympic boxing competition. Poulos is an experienced fighter. Foreman is not, but that power is tremendous. I mean, you're meeting the best. The best that the world could offer. This kid is 19 years old. Can you imagine that? Soviet fighter is moving away. He appears to this reporter to have had enough. That's it. Referee stops contest. I'm an Olympic champion. It's a shock. I was in Vietnam, and uh, couldn't be so proud of my boy at the end that I, you know, tears just probably rolled down my eyes, especially when he raved the flag, man, and we was over there in Vietnam, and I said, that's my boy, that's my boy, man. And, yeah, that was, that was spectacular. That was spectacular. There he is holding an American flag in the center of the ring. People started to applaud, and I bowed to the judges, and I started waving it tirely. Look where I'm from. That's all I was trying to tell them was where I was from. But the black community interpreted George's display differently. It was uh, perceived as a slap in the face, I think, to those uh, black athletes who felt strongly about uh, making a statement in Mexico City. I went home to Houston one day and I met one of my friends. I was walking down the street. He said, how could you do that, man? I said, do what? He said, after the brothers did that thing, how could you wave that flag? I caught hell. I got back home. 
just by way of the American flag. It upset everything. It upset the whole boycott. I got a chance to have, for the first time in my life, three meals a day. I got a chance to get a basic education and to represent my country in the Olympics. How could I not do what I did? And that put a chip on my shoulder, and I started looking for someone to knock it off. When I get in there, you get intense with things, and sometimes you have to frown with it. That's the way you feel. George turned pro and started sparring with Sonny Liston, a former heavyweight champ famous for his surly demeanor. George, are you aware that you have that menacing look when you fight? No, not at all. You can change it just like that. <laughs> <laughs> I started to copy Sonny Liston. He knew how to make people not ask questions and not to stay around him too long. And I thought, if you're going to be heavyweight champ of the world, that's the way you should behave. George was moody to the point where on Monday, I'm, I'm liable to be dealing with that kid who waved the American flag. And on Tuesday, I'd be dealing with a young man who didn't want to talk, and he just wanted to stay away from it. George wasn't too sweet on his opponents, either. 37 in a row went down, 34 by knockout. He was closing in on a title. It's all over! But a man meaner than him stood in his way. I kept thinking, as long as Joe Frazier's heavyweight champ of the world, I won't have much of a chance. I kept hoping he'd die. <laughs> I mean, he had the power to stop a 10-ton truck. Joe Frazier was the first man to beat Muhammad Ali. Most people thought he'd lay the same claim to George Foreman. He was undefeated, and was coming off the Ali win, and he was a three and a half to one favorite. Conventional wisdom heading into the Frazier fight was that George was a raw sort of rookie without the depth or the background to beat a great fighter like Joe Frazier. And I was afraid of Joe Frazier. For the first time entering into the ring in a fight, I was afraid of a guy. George had nothing to fear. Foreman connected, as you saw. You grew up hearing Jack Dempsey, Joe Lewis, even Muhammad Ali. We'll find out tonight just how good George Foreman is in punching and in taking a punch. I never thought my name would be included, the heavyweight champion of the world, George Foreman. Down goes Frazier! Down goes Frazier! Down goes Frazier! That was the most absolute thrill I've ever felt in my life. You're the king of men. Foreman is all over Joe Frazier. Frazier is down again. No one can stand up to you. George Foreman is the heavyweight champion of the world. But George's crown never fit quite right, and it would soon be knocked off. At the end of the second round, I said, oh my god, we're going to lose this fight. I came here as the heavyweight champ of the world. People are looking at me in awe. Now they're patting me on my back. You'll get another chance. Can you imagine your whole life changed within a split second? George Foreman returned from Jamaica as the heavyweight champion of the world and a new father. His daughter, Michi, was born while George was training on the island. I only saw her by way of photograph sent from uh, St. Louis Park, Minnesota. That was my baby girl, my first child. George had met Michi's mother, Adrian, in Minnesota, and they married in 1971. But George came back from Jamaica with not only the title, but with a secret. I had an experience with being unfaithful to my wife in Kingston, Jamaica. That changed me a lot. And there I am with a guilty conscience having to face my wife and family. Despite the guilt, George found himself unable to resist temptation. People are saying, you can have anything you want. You can have anyone you want. 
you start feeling that. Everything became strange. I was divorced in less than a year after becoming the heavyweight champ of the world. The chip on George's shoulder grew. Now he was convinced that no one could knock it off. I thought that with my fist, I could knock any man out. I had reporters that hated him. They'd pull for anybody that he fought because they wanted to see him beaten. His sparring sessions aren't just a training routine. They are instead intense efforts by sparring partners to simply survive a three-minute round with a man whose punching power is frightening. Do you know who I am and what I can do to you? That kind of attitude I had. That, that followed me all the way into Africa. Africa. Zaire. The rumble in the jungle. Ali was everything George wasn't. Handsome, charming, and popular. I'm gonna float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. George can't hit what his eyes can't see. And by the time I got to Africa, he had gone there first, and the whole country, the whole continent fell in love with Ali. Getting back on George Fulmer, why he's not here? Never mind about getting What you mean, back never mind? mind? Why he's always ducking? During the workout, some Zaireans started to chant, Ali Boumaye, Ali Boumaye. Which we later learned meant, uh, Ali kill him. He was so uncomfortable in Zaire that he was in that surly uh, mode almost every day. And it got to the point where he wouldn't even talk to me. So the stage is set. We're just about ready to begin round one, the heavyweight championship of the world at stake. I hit him with the hardest punches. There's a real strong right hand taken on the side of the head of Muhammad Ali. Body, head, side. Hit some real good shots to the body. And he just stood there and he took and he and he winched and winched, and I knew I had him. He got so upset, he's like, you can't do this to me. Punches are not doing any damage, though. And he covered up the pain was there. Ali, the bell rang. Yes, there's the bell ending round two. And he looked up and you could see, I made it. I made it. And I'm looking. He made it. That was the change of the whole boxing match. Ali working to the head of George Foreman. Ali's view of the fight with Foreman was, if he doesn't get me in seven, his parachute won't open. George Foreman seems to have nothing left. Ali seems to be waiting. And I think that he knows that he has control. He was wailing on Ali, but the punches began to slow down. And George didn't know how to pace himself in those days. With George slowing, Ali made his move. You think you're the toughest guy in the world, and no one can really beat you. jungle would drastically alter both men's lives. Ali would grow in stature to mythical proportions. Foreman would go into self-imposed exile in search of himself and his identity. I have these dreams where I'm on the canvas and trying to get up. I wish I had died. George Foreman, the beaten champion. What a moment of tragedy this is. It's like your, your very core of you has no longer exists. He was deeply depressed. The late singer Marvin Gaye said to him, George, you're still the baddest man on the planet. Let's get five guys uh, who are 
contenders or were contenders, heavyweights, and fight them all in one day. Foreman has been a dispirited, lonely man since Ali knocked him out in the eighth round. I thought it was a sign of some kind of breakdown in him, frankly. Alonzo Johnson is very went down with the left. It seemed like a stunt. The second bout. He got into Judge there and hurt him with a left and with a right. Pretty good stunt. The third fight. Oh, what a left by George Foreman. Foreman just told the referee to stop it. But um, I don't think it convinced anybody that uh, what had happened in Africa hadn't happened. That's hardly professional, is it? Now the fans are throwing debris again. It's a disgusting scene. I look for a way to try to establish the people. I'm still tough. He's still strong. He's George Foreman. The fifth opponent, Boone Kirkman. He's in desperate trouble. The left, Florida. But I didn't. I couldn't prove it to anyone else, nor did I ever prove it to myself. He might be good, but as long as I'm around, he's not the best. He beat a banana over now, so he didn't, be, he didn't be no George Foreman. I remember making a vow to myself. The only way I'm going to be carried out again and counted out again, it would have to be on the stretcher. I would die before I get counted out again. Soon, a part of George would die, and what was left would be almost unrecognizable. I was in this deep, dark nothing. All around me was nothing but, but hopelessness. Knockdown. I knew I was about to die. I knew that, and no one could help me. for wind, nor tide, nor sea. George Foreman was lost. Surrendering his title to Ali had stripped him of his soul. The first step in his rediscovery came in the form of shocking news. One of my sisters came to me and said, George, I got something to tell you. Daddy ain't your daddy. I said, what do you mean? She said, there's a man in Marshall, Texas, your real father. him, J.D. Foreman was the father of George's brothers and sisters. But while briefly separated from J.D., Nancy Foreman had spent time with a former serviceman, Leroy Moorhead. You know, you always wonder, where did I get this height? Hey, where did I get this? Where did I get that? But we agreed to meet, and as soon as I saw him, I knew him. He knew me before. I mean, I knew him. It was like a face, you figure. I've seen him somewhere, and maybe it's because he lived in me all this time. Meeting his father gave George an idea. I decided I was going to name, give all my boys the name George Edward Foreman, something that they, no one could take away from them. There are five Georges and two girls named Georgetta and Frida George. George II, Frida George, and Georgetta were all born between 1976 and 1977. They have three different mothers, none of whom George married. Out of respect for his current wife, he prefers not to talk about that part of his past. I we're not gonna do that. I'm married now. So All right, talk about we're gonna talk about marriage. That's it. He now has ten children and four grandchildren. The four youngest kids are with his current wife, Joan. Joan and Dad are two of a kind. They're just. Two peas in a pod, exactly. When I met my wife, my, uh, uh, Joan, that was probably what I've been looking for all my life. In 1977, what George was looking for was a rematch with Muhammad Ali. 12,000 standing, and it's hot. Look at Jimmy Young scoring with combination. After his post-fight experience in Puerto Rico. Look at Young fight back. You see that right? George wouldn't return to the ring for 10 years. This fight is over! Jimmy Young is their victory. And then as I walked back and forward, I started thinking, well, you don't have to worry about that boxing match. It's still George Foreman. You're still famous. You got money. 
As a matter of fact, you could retire now and go to your ranch and die. Now, how did that get in there? Jimmy Young for the unanimous decision. I tried to just get this out of my mind. Finally, the word death just started multiplying in my conversation. It, it overtook me. You're going to die. You're going to die. I remember my legs giving out on me, and I looked around, and I said, hey, y'all, I'm fixing to. Before I could say die, I was gone out of this life. In a split second, I was in this deep, dark nothing over my head, under my feet, was nothing. All around me was nothing but, but hopelessness. If you multiply every sad thought you've ever had in your life, you wouldn't come close to what I saw. And I just said, I don't care if this is death, I still believe there's a God. When I said those words, it was like a giant hand reached in and pulled me out of this nothing. And I was back alive in that dressing room. And I started screaming, Jesus Christ is coming alive in me. Hallelujah, I'm clean. Hallelujah, I'm born again. Oh, they tried to hold me back. I said, I got to go tell the world. George immediately retired from boxing and returned home to Houston. He was 28 years old. Everything changed about me. For some reason, I was no longer angry at anyone. He started talking about the Bible all the time. He wanted everybody to be safe. And I'm telling you, I'm happy. I'm happy. Yeah. I'm happy. I, I believe it. I really do. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> it's great. The former heavyweight champ became a street corner preacher. And here he is, standing on the corner, doing something that when you see people doing it, you say, oh, that poor guy, he's, you know, he's, he's off his rocker. Uh, it was incredible to see him do that. George built a small church in a congregation. Naked you come in this world, look like you're naked now. The little fame and fortune we get is not going to follow us in the grave, brother, sister. He traveled the world as an evangelist. He found peace. I got all the peace in the world. When you don't have money, you got to substitute something. <laughs> People no longer knew I was even the heavyweight champ of the world at all. They liked me for me, and I enjoyed that. They liked me. In 1983, he opened the George Foreman Youth and Community Center. Once he got the youth center up and going, he realized that people really needed this place. The center, located in Houston, had an immediate impact on the community. But the center was expensive to maintain. And after a few years, George's savings were almost gone. I mean, for years, I'd been buying Rolls Royce, swimming pools and backyards. And for the first time, I had something that really meant something. George had an idea. He called me and says, Doc says, what do you think? What do you think about what? He said, I'm coming out of retirement. Oh, my recollection when uh, George came back was, what? Uh, he must need money. I read it all and heard it all. People coming to me, begging me, pleading, don't do it, you're going to get killed. Nearly 10 years had passed since George Foreman had stepped into the ring. He was 38 years old and more than 300 pounds. He was fat. I was go to the gym sometime and watch him work out. And then all of a sudden, you could see the pound just coming off of him, coming off of him. He would get up early in the morning, 4 or 5 o'clock, and be on the road doing his road work. Then he'd come back and go out there and chop wood for two or three hours. Come back go spar all afternoon and then we go right back in that gym and hit the bag for maybe 15 rounds the comeback started in march of 1987 george foreman is 10 years older and 50 pounds heavier than he was in his prime but he performed well enough to make a successful return to the ring I got the knockout power, and that, that's what I wanted. But George was still considered a sideshow, not a contender. 
Yeah, they say that I, I don't fight a guy unless he's on a respirator. I tell them that's a lie. They have to be eight days off the respirator. <laughs> what did impress folks was George's new personality. Bob Abram saw me one day and he said, what a bunch of blank, blank, blank. This guy's putting on some kind of act. <laughs> Even myself, I often think, is he acting? Is, this, is he serious, you know? I'm like, all right, buddy, you can stop now. <laughs> the camera's off. Unlike the old George, the new George was popular. Fans loved his simple message. I'd like to show the whole world that the age 40 is not a death sentence at all. There's no way in the world that you can lay down and stop dreaming just because you had a birthday or two. The public got excited. Wait a minute. What does this man got the rest of them have? George won 24 consecutive fights and in 1991 earned a title fight against Evander Holyfield. That was an electric night in Atlantic City because uh, I think people came there to sort of say goodbye after the inevitable beating. Now the crowd comes alive again as Holyfield stopped punching and Foreman steps in. Um, and there they were in the ninth and 10th and 11th rounds, thinking that the guy might actually have a chance to win the fight. Holyfield stopped punching and Foreman wails away again. That moment when Holyfield rained 19 straight punches onto his head, you know, left, right, left, right, and just ripping every punch as hard as he could. A solid right hand George. stunned George Foreman. And George just stood in and took it and plodded forward. It was majestic, you know? George was unsatisfied. I didn't come back to the ring to put on a big show like that. I came back to be heavyweight champ of the world, and I'd gotten my chance, and I blew it. For 17 years, George had chased the ghost of Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali has won. Muhammad trying to reshape his legacy. He'd be haunted for three more, but it would be worth the wait. We know what you're about, George. You don't know nothing about me. You'll find you out Saturday. About me. Like, Thank you. You don't know nothing about me. All you're doing is running around reading clippings and hearing them press about me. You don't know nothing about me. second shot at the heavyweight championship. In 1995, 26-year-old Michael Moore provided it. He had just defeated uh, Holyfield. They decided, well, we'll fight George, he's harmless. So you see no chance that George can win the fight? Very little, very little. When the fight began, the younger man dominated. <laughs> Moore got braver. Michael Moore seems increasingly willing to step up into George's range. He now looks to me as though he thinks he's going to be able to knock Foreman out. He believed that I'm old. He's looking for a knockout. That's the one thing you don't want to do is go hunt a puncher. I think the myth of George's power has been exposed by Michael Moore so far. You all right, George? Come on. If you're going to be a good champion, there's going to be some bruising, some giving, and some taking. But I had my plan. George has got such a strong mind. A lot of fighters get knocked out because they lose their will to win. But George has got that great competitive spirit. For nine rounds, George Foreman looked every one of his 45 years. Then, late in the 10th, he landed a punch for the ages. Again with the Atlas. Now Michael Moore is down. in my prayers. I said, God, if I win this thing again before the whole world, I'm going to get down on my knees and thank you. And when it happened, I got down on my knees and thanked God above. George Foreman knelt in prayer in the neutral corner. The victory was not a personal one at all. This time it meant something to other people than, than myself. Don't ever let nobody tell you that there's something that you can't do in life. 
The world is yours. Just get out there and conquer it. What George did is really unprecedented in boxing history. It made him one of those uh, special, dramatic figures who will always stand out. In 2004, 55-year-old George Foreman announced another comeback. I'm working on right now, and I've been when training and working out to get down to 225 pounds. If I do, I'm going to have one more boxing match. My wife is not around, I mean it. <laughs> it's not about money, but to be productive, to get up in the morning and have a job, it's the greatest thing a man could have. Again, it's been more than seven years since George last entered the ring, but this time, no one's laughing. George Foreman has beaten the odds before. You can start from the bottom in this country and make whatever you want of your life. If you can dream anything, you can do it. I fold my hands and wait. Nor care for wind, nor tide, nor sea. I rave no more against time or fate. For lo, my own shall come to me.